Hey everybody, welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today we're going to be talking about our ancestral karma and how in fact we can heal our ancestral karma and free ourselves from unhealthy family patterns. And we're talking to Dr. Stephen um, D. Farmer, who was a was and is I guess still a psychotherapist as well as a shaman and he's going to be talking about how he combines those very two powerful practices and healing some of our family patterns so welcome well thank you CJ glad we got underway okay yeah (laughs) (laughs) so first of all for people who aren't familiar with this term family patterns what does it mean what you can identify and it's pretty clearly you can see the physical patterns that show up it's always amusing to me, slightly amusing to me to say, gosh, he looks just like his father, just like his mother. Yeah. And you go, well, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there is a resemblance, you know. Yes, the exactly. They're lineage. called genes. <laughs> so that's, a, that's the most uh, obvious kind of pattern. Yeah. It's the ones that we can physically see or looks like grandpa or grandma or whatever. Uh, the ones that get where it gets uh, even more interesting, I think, is beyond the physical pattern is the other kinds of patterns that show up, sometimes even physical, but um, mm-hmm. often... Uh, there would be emotional patterns. There would be um, uh, mental patterns that show up. Uh, that's what I'm calling in the uh, uh, karma mm-hmm. in this sense, in this, uh, for this purpose here, is those patterns that follow down through the generations. Mm-hmm. So what are some examples of an emotional or mental or, you said, self-defeating patterns, which I assume are in the, akin to the emotional mental? Like, what are examples that you've seen when you've worked with clients? Sure. Well, addictions, alcohol, alcoholism, etc., comes to mind first as mm-hmm. as a pattern that does show up um, frequently. You see that down uh, down the line through patterns. Right. It's like a joke about uh, the Irish, which I'm part Irish. Yeah. Uh, what's the joke? It says, "Where does the uh, Irish family go on vacation? They go to a different pub." <laughs> you know, it's one it's one of these assumptions <laughs> we make about that particular um, cultural and genetic influence. Yeah. There's that proneness to uh, drinking, even alcoholism, or um, a related sort of an adi- yeah, a that one seems to be sort of like hit, like cultural, environmental, and then also genetic. But yeah. then, are there certain kind of emotional things? Like my mom was a worrier, my dad was a worrier. Oh yeah, I yeah. thus will worry too <laughs> to honor my family lineage. <laughs> uh, I'd worry about that, CJ. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, I, I see that. Um, for instance, my father, I, I really very young and uh, it's taken me a good part of my life to uh, heal this but Mm -hmm. uh, very shy as a child you know very uh, kind of a weird kid Mm -hmm. you know and I I jokingly say now that I get paid as a weird person I'm a professional (laughs) weird person so (laughs) it's okay to do that now they don't lock you up or put you in a 72 hour hold now when you hear voices you know that don't (laughs) actually exist in the visible form but my father was that god he was a good man you know yeah. i've done a lot of healing as as i'm sure you have and many of the mm-hmm. listeners have on the parental um relationship but my father was always very shy the only mm-hmm. the only thing that would um, <clears throat> excuse me would where he would come out would be when he'd be angry yeah <laughs> or if he'd been drinking you know then he would come out mm-hmm. uh, in, but often it was anger something like that mm-hmm. but otherwise he was pretty reclusive and kept to himself a lot. So that would be an example of an emotional pattern, certainly that I see both in his father and my father that's been handed down, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, handed down karmically, or mm-hmm. as you, you would say, unhealthy family patterns. Yeah. There's, health, there's healthy ones too. Yeah. I, I Wait, so let's, in, go, let's go to that sure. shyness one. So in, in the instance of your great-grandfather, your father, and then, and now... When it's hand, this pattern is handed down to you, do you have the opposite reaction to it, or do you get triggered by shyness, or do you think that you're you have instances when you are shy that you've kind of inherited this thing? I, I would say um, it's not exactly shyness, but I know that I tend to be more introverted. Mm-hmm. You know, I can I can entertain myself for hours. You know, with various things. It's yeah. just the nature of that sort of um, characteristic, which. Mm-hmm sometimes shows up as shyness, yeah. you know, being reticent, uh, social phobia, uh, being res- reticent to be with people, that sort of thing. Right. Uh, it's, um, it reminds me of Robin Williams. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, every time I say his name, I feel a sadness about that still. Mm. However, uh, reportedly, uh, he did really well. You know, and obviously, we've got lots of information on that, yeah. how, how well he did in an audience. But apparently, 
one to one, he had a little trouble with. Yeah. yeah. He he like get him two people. He's got an audience, but one person it was a little more difficult. Interesting. And um, I think that's the nature of introversion. There's actors, uh, male and female actors that that same kind of thing. Meryl Streep apparently, you know, apparently, you know, is very introverted. Yeah. Myself, I, I see that introversion is that I I introverts tend to have a, a fairly rich um, inner life. Right. And uh, extroverts tend to look outside themselves for that kind of stimulation. That's a broad generalization. Yes. But yeah. That's true. It, it holds yeah. me. Yeah. My daughter, I've got two adult daughters. Uh, Nicole is like that. You know, she's my oldest daughter. She's, she's an extrovert. Oh, she's an extrovert. She loves to extroversive as Jung, Jung called it extroversive, which is slightly different. It means we get our mm, stimulation from uh, social engagement. And yeah. Things outside. Whereas introversive is more uh, the pattern I see in myself. I see it, Jessica. I see it in people where you you um, you get that richness, or you 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 find that internally. Whereas uh, extroversives tend to, you know, Nicole will talk her problems through. Yeah. So, but she's a she's your daughter, but yet she she didn't actually that wasn't that genealogy or family emotional pattern wasn't passed down to her. No, somehow Literally. it skipped her, you know. Now, how that did, I'm not sure, but yeah. I see it in my younger daughter who tends to be more introversive and, and pensive and thoughtful and, you know, thinks things through and, and finds her richness internally. Yeah. Uh, uh, I've had to overcome that shyness that I saw in my father and my grandfather. Yeah. Um, and yet I still retain that introversive uh, characteristic. Yeah. I, I've had to, I, I'll tell you a short story, okay? Yeah. I was, uh, after my master's, I got my uh, MA, you know, my Master of Arts, and I went, okay, great. I felt compelled to teach. Yeah. I just knew I had to teach, you know, soul's destiny. Yeah, I can see that yeah. now, of course. I was called by one of the local community colleges here in California, and you're uh, actually allowed to teach with a master's. You don't mm -hmm. need a doctorate. So I applied to seven different community colleges after my master's. I get a call. Get this. This is how God works, how spirit works. <laughs> Swear to God. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I do. Um, I get a call from this one college out of the seven, and it was a new college that was a college without walls. Wow, okay. It was, it was already with, um, associated with a, um, a standing college, a community mm -hmm. college, but it was a new branch of it. I get called down there, and I do a good interview, suit and tie day. Uh, I did a pretty good job, you know, of doing the interview. Obviously, mm -hmm. the lady who interviewed me went back, talked to her boss, came back. Yeah. And I'm thinking, great, you know, I'm going to get the job. I felt really good. I, I'm going to teach psychology 1A. I yeah. know. I just love psychology. That's what I graduated yeah. with. She comes back. Get this, CJ. She comes back and says, um, yeah, we want to hire you. And I went, great. She goes, we want you to teach assertiveness training. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about a cosmic joke, <laughs> but in the, <laughs> uh, yeah, it still amuses me. It's like, yeah, I love okay, it. What's it? What's it? So I, I, you know, I, I took and studied it that summer. I read as many books as I could. I took a couple of courses that were available and I don't think I was more than about two days ahead of the 18 week class, <laughs> but in the, the elegance of, of our soul's destiny, how different things can happen to us like that, like you know, your own story, how, yeah. how we're, we're either pulled or pushed into um, areas that we might not ordinarily consciously choose. Yeah. I didn't want to, didn't really want to teach assertiveness training, but I wanted to teach and that was more important. Right. And as a result, that's been a big part of my purpose, a teacher healer. That is yeah. my you know, yeah. on the planet this round at least. Yeah. Anyway. So, so then, when, when, so when I'm, I'm thinking back at your story, so actually, what happened in this life is you had an opportunity to address whether shyness is something that yep. you wanted or yeah. not, right? Because it's not shyness is not a problem less necessarily or a family yeah. pattern that you want to get rid of, but you you made a choice like, okay, this is something that I've kind of inherited a certain set of behaviors or emotional pattern right. that I've inherited. And yeah. now I have to choose whether to continue it or not. And so yeah. what I found interesting is your book is that let's say that you've decided to address this issue of yeah. shyness, um, that you would be addressing it for yourself and all the lineage that preceded you. Right. Right. This is a, um, a concept that is, 
not familiar to most of our Western yeah. civilization. Mm-hmm. And I, I'll even back up a little bit more. The act of calling mom, dad, deceased loved ones as ancestors, we don't tend to think of them as ancestors. Yeah. We tend to yeah. think of them as deceased loved ones, yeah. which, is, which is valid, of course. One of my aims in uh, writing this book and teaching the workshops, etc., is that I want to bring that consciousness about ancestors in. In fact, I believe very strongly that the ancestors have um, promoted me to do this. Mm, mm-hmm. I know that. I just know that. I don't just believe it. Your ancestors or ancestors generally? Ancestors all over. generally, yes. Mm. Uh, not just specifically my mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, but when we speak of ancestors, we go back a long, long ways. Yeah. We tend to think more like, okay, the influence of our grandparents, great-grandparents, parents, etc. But the influences can go back quite a ways, uh, e- even further to the what you might call the old ones. Yeah. But let's let's step back here to the, the here and now and yeah. previous generations, our biological lineage. Yes. Um, Hollister Rand, a friend and a, a, very, um, a very good medium, very gifted medium, I interviewed her for this as well as uh, several other people and mm-hmm. did quite a bit of research on this. But she said it pretty well. She said, when you do your healing, no matter what the nature of your healing is, that healing doesn't just go forward to your descendants. Right. It goes backwards. When we die, we're not done. <laughs> right. We're still we have, living spirits. Still, yeah, we have some cleaning up to do. Yeah. It may be that... Uh, after I die, maybe in, in that, that soul essence that I exist as in spirit world, uh, I may have to come back and make some amends. I might need to help out my grandchildren, great-grandchildren, my descendants in some way. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, if I've hurt someone, I might have to make amends to them, like I made mm-hmm. reference to. Uh, I may have still, uh, like my brother who died some years ago, for about the first uh, four or five years, he would show up. Yeah. Mm. And the way I know he'd show up is he was still smoking. I, mm. I have no, I don't understand how or why he'd do that, but I could smell the you smoke. You could smell the smoke. Wow. Yeah. And often, you know, people report, you know, grandma will leave a penny or something to show that yeah. she's present and helping us out. Yeah. Uh, I may be assigned by spirit to help a, a great grandchild, you yeah, know, in some way. But there, there's, there's ways of, of cleaning up that karma as I move on. And the living, can uh, can help the ancestors do that. Mm-hmm. That's what that's what that means is that when I do my healing, not just the ancestral healing or the ex, the exercise in the book, although they're I think really good ones, mm-hmm. uh, forgiveness processes, um, intergenerational healing, being able to work with an ancestor for healing oneself, healing the ancestor and in turn healing the descendants. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's a very exciting realm. You can tell I get very, yeah. very worked up. You know, I well, I was just thinking back at what you said. You know, you've actually you said that you've been working a long time um, and thinking about your relationship with your dad and that all that healing is actually not only healing you today in the present right. time, but then also helping your dad kind of either come to realizations right. or shifts because you're shifting, you're yep. still connected to him at some level. So when you're shifting, he's shifting, right? Absolutely. He, he's come to me on more than one occasion. Yeah. And, um, one of the, uh, the things about the book, Healing Ancestral Karma, uh, is I, I set up a sequence of um, research, you could say, that uh, to me proves that there's life after death. Yeah. That, you know, near-death experiences, mediumship, direct contact. I'm sure you've had direct contact yeah, with some of your ancestors, of yeah. course. My dad has come to me. He came to me not too long ago in... Uh, a process I use with my work, which is the shamanic journey, where you, mm-hmm. you go into an alternate reality, basically. And uh, unexpectedly, I went to a, uh, a realm there in the upper world, which is one of the worlds that the celestial. Right. Uh, called the Land of the Ancestors, which I'd never been to before. I went, oh, cool, of course, you know, I'm doing this work. Of course, there's the Land of the yes, Ancestors. Yes, I found that it, fascinating, the Land of That was so... my father. Yeah. He shows, Richard, he shows up, wow. and he gave me this. I get chills as I say that because he gave me this very, um, makes me emotional. He gave me this very, very beautiful message. Um, 
things he would say would be like, you know, hey, you're doing a great job. You know, keep going. You know, and that was such a blessing. Yeah. Oh, what a blessing from an ancestor to yeah. get that sort of message. Yeah. Second, another piece was my grandson, Jaden, who's now 10. Um, he was very close to his step grandfather, but uh, his grandma and grandpa, uh, step grandfather separated. Mm -hmm. And there was some concern on the part of my daughter, his mom, that Jaden would, um, he needed more contact from me. Mm hmm. And that's what my father told me. He gave me very specific instructions. He says, mm. you keep, remember what I was saying about watching yeah. out for a grandchild? So in your book, you talk about um, blessings and you also talk about curses. Now, when you went to the land of ancestors and you saw your dad, do you see that, and, and he gave you this advice with respect to Jaden, is that yeah. an example of what a blessing is or is it something different? Hey, that could be one example, CJ. Uh, a blessing could be uh, both conscious and unconscious. In other words, you may be aware of the blessing as in the story that I just shared. Yeah. You may not, not be aware of it. You may sense a presence. You have to have the, the openness and um, the willingness, really, yeah. to receive those blessings. I think that's really important. That, yeah. Oh, I don't deserve to be blessed. You know, those kind of old beliefs or something like that yeah. is it's going to either uh, interfere with or completely dissipate the blessings that you uh, that that are being offered by yeah. your ancestors. So maybe so, like blessings of good luck, like you're looking for a job and then your ancestors will be sending you kind of good karma, good blessings, right. that kind of thing. Is that what a blessing is? I, that's a perfect example. Yeah, just okay. a, a blessing that says, uh, uh, well, his, his saying to me, my father's saying to me, hey, you're doing a great job. Yeah. What, what, what a blessing. Uh, I'm repeating myself, but what a blessing that was yes. to hear that, even yes. as you saw. I got kind yeah. of emotional about it still. Yeah. Uh, and a nice warm uh, feeling of, of being loved and appreciated. Yeah. Well, um, it's like a healing almost. Do you know what I mean? Like when you yeah. said that and you felt that, is, I yeah. felt a certain amount of healing that happened. Almost even just repeating it is like, ah, oh, it's like a blessing. You know, it exactly. feels like healing a bomb to put something that was raw and just kind of healing it. So I, yep. I see that as a blessing too. But what are some of the curses? I mean, what are the things that they curse us? And why would they curse us? Because we never well, visit and call. Like what what, what happens that? <laughs> no, I, that? I, I tend to... Um, First off, I tend to feel protected all the time, hmm. sleeping, awaking. And by your ancestors think, by, or by the well, land let me, of the Let me just finish yeah. that thought. Yeah. I, I feel protected because of what got me into this back many years ago and then eventually about five or six years ago was shamanism. Hmm. When I uh, studied and trained in, in a variety of, of methodologies with shamanism, and as a result of that, and this was my path, you know, maybe others, some mm -hmm. people uh, may have a, a close relationship with another, with an ascended master or Jesus mm -hmm. or Buddha or whatever. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter the form, right. but what really works for you. And this work, this phew, really worked solid for me when I discovered it. I went, mm -hmm. this is it. This is what I need to be mm -hmm. doing now. Mm -hmm. But I, my spirit guides that I work with, whether I'm consciously aware of them or not, I have an, it's faith, but it's not blind faith. It's faith based on logic and experience mm -hmm. that I don't feel like any, any um, psychic attacks or bad energy can, can really come into me in any way, including any kind of curses. Mm -hmm. So I just want to qualify that by saying the more that uh, as your listeners um, uh, develop these relationships with their particular spirit guides, mm -hmm. uh, the less likely are they to be um, subject to curses of any kind. So ah, okay. Okay, got it. So this isn't your necessarily your ancestors cursing you. It's Correct. your ancestors wouldn't necessarily be cursing there. They would be yeah. protecting you. This is actually protecting you from other curses from other people. Right. Ah, now, okay. When we, go, when we go into ancestor land, <laughs> when we die and go into ancestor yeah. land, we're already starting that transformative process in the spiritual evolution as ancestors. I was given a whole typology, and it's not important what it is. I, I put that in the book, too. But this is yeah. given to me as a means of my understanding through direct revelation what happens after you die. Mm -hmm. And you do go through a sequence, as, you, as described in the book. Mm -hmm. Now, somebody else may have a different typology or a different um, map. Of right. the afterworld. That's okay. It's not that's not important. 
shamanism is the path of direct revelation. Yeah. It's working with your spirit guides and receiving that information directly rather than just only through an intermediary. Mm -hmm. So I was given this, uh, um, uh, this map, I guess would be the best way to describe it, that really helped me understand and make sense of what happens after I die or after mm -hmm. any of us dies. Mm -hmm. And how but, does the land of ancestors fit? Is the land of ancestors just your specific ancestors or for all ancestors kind of hang out? Well, so stuff? far, so far, it's just my, my lineage. But, okay. uh, since you asked that, I, I made a distinction in um, as I continue to work with this and it, this is what I described in the book, uh, a distinction between three kinds of ancestors where mm -hmm. there is overlap amongst the three, and mm -hmm. it certainly can be. One is the, the obvious one we think of, and I think most uh, indigenous cultures uh, consider this as the biological lineage. Right. Some people, uh, the Hawaiians, for instance, uh, some can sing songs that trace their lineage way, 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 way back. Mm -hmm. And it's carried through with their songs and their, their tales. Mm-hmm. Um, the biological lineage is the one that most people w will first pay attention to, but often it does, only goes back maybe three generations, right. maybe four. Yeah, if you're the lucky. Other, the second, yeah, exactly. The second kind of ancestors I call territorial ancestors, CJ. And those are the ancestors that, that still roam around the land, that, that maybe ancient Oh, right, yes. Like Native and, uh, Americans and where yes. I am in Pacific Northwest or the... Yes, exactly. Yeah. In, in fact, um, Michael Harner, who is, uh, I think, the person most responsible for bringing shamanism into contemporary culture, mm -hmm. uh, a great man because he... Uh, I did training with him and he'd always go... Uh, people to ask him, what about this, Michael? And he'd go, well, journey on it. You yes. Know, <laughs> find out for yourself. Go to your spirit guide. I met him and he did the same thing. He did. Years he later, he's like 80 it. years yeah. old still. He's like, well, Michael, what should I do about this? He's like, ask spirit your God. spirit. Why are you ask asking me? Ask your guys. That's, that's why I think he's uh, he's not he never set out to be a guru or have. Yeah, all the I love people. it. That's one of the things he's I like about him most. Training. Yeah. So he said he had an interesting theory, which is uh, remember in the 60s when um, uh, hippies and such were up in San Francisco and they were dressing in Native American garb. And yeah. his thought was that. Maybe the, the Native American spirits are, are coming into consciousness more and more, maybe through the mind-altering drugs or something, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But I thought it was very interesting, and that's, that's always stayed with me. That's territorial ancestors. Mm -hmm. When we can consciously engage with those, such as uh, working with them to, to bless the land where we live, wherever it is, apartment, mm -hmm. house, you know, condo, whatever it may be, but do a land blessing and ask yes. the ancestors of the land for that blessing, and they yeah. will do that to you. Yeah. You know, they will they will welcome you and they will protect you. Yeah. You don't have to believe me. I, I always tell people, don't believe me or disbelieve me. Try it for yourself. You know. Yeah. It's, and I, here's the interesting thing, because one of the things that you said in your book is that we we're talking about um, healing ancestral karma, free yourself from unhealthy farm, family patterns. We're talking to Dr. Stephen Farmer. Um, one of the things that you talked about in your book was that you know some people say oh you know you have to be careful because there are these disembodied spirits and mm. and you know you can get spirit attacks and all these different things and one of the things that you said in your book was yep. it's kind of like yeah only if you believe that that's the case what did you mean by that I knew you were going to ask me that and I'm glad you did <laughs> Here, here's what um, I here's what I've come up with uh, you asked me five years from now and I might change things with new information <laughs> but uh, what I have realized is that if I have a mindset that believes that the world is a dangerous place, if I have a mindset that believes that, that evil spirits are out there lurking, you know, waiting for me, I will manifest that. That's mm -hmm. not, that's a no brainer. You know, okay, I say yeah. no brainer because I, I, anybody who's listening to this show, I'm sure that you, you have a, an influence on what you draw in mm -hmm. and what you, what you, uh, what you pull in or invite yes. in would be another yeah. way. So, Yes, there are, there are earthbound spirits. You ask any medium, and there are earthbound spirits. Some people say that when we die, we hang around for three days, and then we move on, we go through this process. Right. I, everybody's got a little different take different on theory, what yeah. happens. But what earthbound spirits are, typically there can be certain things, like suicide, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody who's committed suicide, typically that one of their first tasks oh. is to go around and try to reach the people they've hurt oh. and make amends of some sort. 
and it could be uh, that the people that uh, they're making amends to may not even be aware of it. Right. Uh, there was one image this one writer came up with. He, he did some traveling uh, meditation, and he came up with a, uh, uh, a vision of this one area that he went to or was taken to, and he said it was, it was weird because there were all these, these spirits that were going around to the living and going, please forgive me, please forgive me. Mm. And he realized um, from the information he got that these were people that had committed suicide, oh, not realizing that, that they've hurt people by their very act. Right. So, and again, we can, even in those situations, we can help our ancestors move on. Yeah. You know, through our own uh, practice of forgiveness. And doing yeah. with intention and with consciousness. Yeah, you know, we actually had in our basement, we actually had some type of entity, and it was uh, someone who had awful things, unspeakable things happen in this house, mm -hmm. and they wanted to continue being here to protect the people in the house to say, like, by the way, unspeakable wow. things have happened in this house. And I was dialoguing Sweet. with this entity and allowed this little boy actually to go I'm like you know go to the light it's okay we now know we're safe cool. and everything it's it, I think that I think it's interesting to to make sure that you know th I don't think these these entities are just lost they're like human beings that are lost um they don't necessarily have to be nefarious or going to possess you or I those totally kind of things agree. I totally um, agree so I want to go back to the the last part the unhealthy family pattern so um and, and we're going all the way reversing all the way back to the very, very beginning of the conversation okay. when we were talking about emotional patterns or mental patterns or even you know health patterns that have set mm -hmm. up mm -hmm. and I guess I'm I am sure you've thought about this because this is your area of focus lately how do you even think these patterns are formed you know there has to be a seed when you know sexual abuse starts or addiction starts how are how are they started, and then how are they continued? Well, the, I, a, a story comes to mind. Uh, a, a good friend of mine in Australia, Jeremy, has uh, shared this story publicly. So I'm not, and I, he's also given me permission to uh, share this in the book as well as uh, publicly. Uh, he's 16 years old. He's he's white. He's Caucasian. Uh, very deep, deep eyes. You know, very like yeah, penetrating kind of gaze. And um, at age 16, he was in all sorts of trouble. You know, was, again, by his own admission, he was selling drugs. He was getting in trouble, uh, spending time in juvenile hall. And uh, his grandfather came to get him from juvenile hall when he was 16. Grandfather's mm -hmm. black. Mm -hmm. uh, takes him up to northern Queensland to the land of his people and of his lineage, his father's lineage. His mother apparently was uh, Irish. And uh, uh, he was aware of that, but he never knew his father up to that. Mm -hmm. uh, he was uh, he spent two years there under his uh, grandfather's tutelage and going through an initiation into the ways of his people, the Guku Yalanji people, mm -hmm. and uh, came back into Sydney. And as he said, he still got into some scrapes for a while, but it was one of those things that when you try it again after all that, you, it just wasn't working. So mm -hmm. he really changed his ways, became a teacher, and he's... Then lately, uh, he's in his late 30s by now, he's um, doing a, a wonderful job with Aboriginal youth, you know, mm. inspiring them, helping them out in that mm -hmm. way. So he's found his mission. Anyway, he uh, found out his father was in jail. His biological father was in jail. And uh, he went to visit him in jail. And one of the most remarkable things was that he, he had very similar wounds on the left side of his body as his father. Wow. Now, Back to your question, how does something... Literally a physical wound. Yes, literally a physical wound. Wow. And also his father was in jail. And yes. He was in jail, juvenile hall. Yeah, but the great-grandfather wasn't, so that wasn't something no. that passed on. It started with his father. Yep, started with his father. Probably yeah. going... Uh, um, uh, it's, it's like in New Zealand, the Maoris. I, I, there was a movie out some time ago about the Maoris which they're, they're a warrior culture, but they have, yeah. they, they don't have anywhere to go with it at this yeah. point. So there was fascinating. You know, yeah. Uh, and they're all about scarring and yeah, you know, so anyway, Jer uh, Jeremy, uh, that, that's a good story about how this, this family pattern can be passed down even physically. Yeah. And, and second, I guess you would say emotionally, mentally, right. Uh, he was headed down that road up till age 16 till his grandfather rescued him. The same thing. He would have ended up in jail had his grandfather not, for some reason, uh, unbeknownst to me, and I, I think possibly to Jeremy, 
uh, came down and basically rescued him from that lifestyle. So mm. there's a change in um, karma or the family pattern. Do you think the, that? Do you think that? So this just generated a little a thought bubble in my head. So okay. do you think that what happened was, you know, if you think an entity goes through and has these life experiences to help, you know, me as an individual, my dad died, it helped me shift and grow as a person mm -hmm. that a family actually has a set of experiences so you know this experience that for was formed with jeremy's father do you think that that's something similar like the universe was bringing it so that his whole family lineage could kind of learn and experience this this yeah. dissonance between new and old culture i mean because how is it formed why was it created in that way how is it formed i guess that's one theory <laughs> does that make sense yeah, I, I think I think I understand your question. I I think it's a combination. You mentioned this earlier. It's a yeah. combination of things. It's social. It's cultural. It's genetic. Yeah. Uh, and we know now. And I I understand you interviewed Dawson Church, who is a man I greatly respect. Uh, yeah. One of my favorite books is sitting over there, Genie in Your Jeans. Just yeah. Got earmarked all over the place. Um, but um, this new science of epigenetics is demonstrating through research that. Um, are, it's, uh, the DNA can't change. You're handed a certain set of DNA, right. but it, how the DNA expresses itself through the genes can be changed, can be modified mm -hmm. by uh, basically about three or four different things. One, um, trauma. Mm. Big one. Mm -hmm. Big one right there. Yes. Trauma modify the way the genes express themselves. Uh, another is toxicity mm. of some sort. Yeah. Um, it, and the third is uh, what you've come to believe, you know, that set of cultural and personal beliefs that you've come to uh, subscribe to, whether conscious Yes, or not. okay, that makes sense, yeah. So all those things combine together. So here is a, mo a modern-day Maori who is probably questioning. So his environment, the culture, his beliefs, his struggles, his trauma may have initiated with Jeremy's dad and then got passed down to Jeremy. Right, and I would correct you though. Uh, forgive me, but he he's not Maori. Um, he's Aboriginal. Maori oh, is New me. Zealand. I, that's right. I slipped over to New Zealand. Okay, sorry. It, no, that's all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Interesting. So that's how they're formed. Okay, yeah. so how did one? You know, because you know, so I was reading on the web. Of course, the resource of nothing and everything, right? <laughs> but I was reading yeah. on the web, reading like Psychology 101, and they're uh -huh. saying, well, you know, how you heal these kind of problems if you have addiction abuse that's been passed down, or emotional abuse, or physical abuse, all these kinds of negative family patterns. How you heal them is, you know, setting boundaries, behavioral change, those kind mm -hmm. of things. Mm -hmm. um, so that seems to be the psychological approach. What would a shaman do to heal these things? Or what would you do who, who you're blending of these two things? What have you found is the most successful way of healing those kind of things? Oh, I'd like to say shamanism is it. But, you know, I, quite frankly, these days, um, the way shaman, and the way I practice and the way shamanism in general is practiced by, by so many people have come to that, um, that doorway and walked through it and got training in shamanic practices. Um, the aim of shamanism generally, and it has been true for 40,000 years or more, there has been evidence, there's evidence on every continent of some shamanic uh, uh, shamanism in every culture um, you can conceive of in indigenous cultures today even, the ones at least that remain, mm -hmm. there still is these shamanic realities. So there's been an upsurge of shamanism in the last mm, about 30 years, and again, it's not just Harner, but Certainly, he's had uh, yeah. he's wielded the strongest influence. Yeah, he's trained a lot of people that some of whom you may have had on your show as yeah. well, uh, that are out there and doing the work like myself. So, in uh, circling around to answering your question, uh, I don't think there is one way. You know, as as a shamanic practitioner, I may uh, subscribe or prescribe to someone. Okay, you got to get massaged twice a week. You know, yeah. something like that. If they right. have the, the wherewithal to do that. Uh, I may send them to an herbalist because although I understand certain herbs and I've studied them, I don't consider myself an expert, so right. I might employ that. Allopathic medicine sometimes. Right. I, had a, I had a friend that uh, he had to make the choice. Uh, he's got cancer in his uh, throat. And after some discussion, he had to make the choice whether to go allopathic, uh, the typical approach, radiation, chemo, etc., or go, um, you would say, more alternative and natural method. Yeah. And uh, the yeah. advice was, you got to go one way or the other. You know, it's better not to mix them. Hmm. That was, 
that was not my advice, but someone else's that I told. I'd be mixing all over the place if I was in that situation. I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure I'd go alternative, but you never know yeah. until you're at yeah. that. You yeah, know, I'd be mixing. God forbid, you know, that we have yeah. to face that kind of thing. But I, I, he's a good bud, and I've been supporting him, and he chose to go alternative. So uh, what I'm saying about that is here's my gig, okay, shamanism yeah. and shamanic practice. I look for and discern as much as I can through the information I, that's provided by my spirit guides, what's the best treatment approach for a particular individual. Oh. What we aim to do is heal at the spiritual level because I believe, and I've been shown, every condition has somewhere its root in uh, as a spiritual uh, misfire, you could say. Mm -hmm. uh, one example, a good one that's, I think, quite common is soul loss. Mm -hmm. Sounds pretty heavy to say soul loss, but... We obviously don't lose our soul. Yeah, yeah. Parts but what of we ourselves. do, we have fragmentation. Yes. You know, I'm sure you've had guests on and perhaps experienced yeah. that yourself where the soul fragments and often during trauma. Yes. Uh, it's, we, and psychologically, because I've got that background as a therapist for 30 plus years, psychologically, it's dissociation. Uh, when I was in an accident when I was 19, I remember that feeling of just, I'm not all here. Yes. That's often the yeah. feeling of dissociation. Mm -hmm. Well, from the shamanic point of view, you're not. Right. Your <laughs> you soul know? drifted There's a off. Part of you that went, hey, yeah. I'm out of here. Yeah, yeah. A part so, of you drifted off during that age 19, during that car accident or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And came back. Yes. That's a possibility, especially with a, uh, a one incident trauma. But right. you're a little child. This is where it gets kind of, you know, heartbreaking in a way. Um, when you're a child, you're much more vulnerable to that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Mm -hmm. you know, the wounds and the hurts, not just of the, of, uh, the caretakers, the guardians, parents, whomever it may be, uh, certainly that's, but it's the long term. It's like sustained abuse, sustained mm -hmm. trauma over a period of time that um, really sets us up for mm -hmm. the soul piece staying away. Right. So my job in that instance Again, with the advice of my consultants, I don't decide which where to go, you know, four years old, 10 years old, 30 years old. My guides I trust immensely will take me to the soul part that most needs to be returned, typically. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I say typically because 95% of the time that's how I operate. Mm -hmm. uh, but my point being is, yeah, so I bring that back and install uh... that. So there's an opportunity for it to rejoin. Right. Spend Interesting. Some yeah. Okay, so that here's the logic as I understand it is that let's say that the the trauma could could in theory start another ancestral wound that would continue on and onward. Yes. What yeah. you do is you go back to you have a, a plethora of different tools, but one of the things that you do it sounds like fairly often in your practice is you go back and retrieve those soul parts so that right. the lineage the kind of potential potentiality of a negative family pattern doesn't continue. Exactly. I get it. And again, that's, it's a powerful treatment, a powerful shamanic treatment. And at the same time, the individual may need additional resources. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, addictions, you know, go to a 12 step program. Right. You know, we'll get, we'll get down and see where that all started and maybe yes. there was soul loss or something else. Right. You'll go to and heal it on a spiritual level, but then there are behavioral changes, all sorts of other things that go exactly. into that. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. But what I found really interesting in your book, and I don't know if we can step this through a quick little exercise, but what I found interesting is I actually did a, quite a few, few bit of these exercises and I thought right. about, and one of my favorite ones was the one in the, the latter part of the book where you line up all your relatives and you oh, go yeah. into your mother's side and your mother's father and your mother's grandfather and your mother's mother's grandfather and father, you know, like you go through all that lineage. Yeah, three generations. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and you kind of go and ask like, how, you know, who, how, how do I feel when I, when I expand into your presence and, and what did I get from that feeling and how, and what part of you is still part of me? And I, I found that yeah. that, process is fascinating because we don't often do right. that right we don't often think about well my grandfather 
And like I get my mom, like I can see the parts that are part of me that are my mom, but probably, yeah. but even having explored that very deeply, I came up with new stuff <laughs> as a result because I never have stepped into right. her being. Um, so that was a really very, very powerful exercise that um, folks, if you end up getting this book, which I suggest you do, Healing Ancestral Karma, that was um, a very powerful exercise. Um, we don't have the time to do one of those because that, that took me probably about an hour, two hours to just go through just one line. Absolutely. That, that's uh, uh, the two exercises towards the latter part of the book um, require fair uh, more yeah, time than we have available. I, I will say, though, if I may. Uh, just today, the publisher did a formal book launch, even though it's been out for about a month. Yeah. And um, there is a 25-minute meditation that's actually mm -hmm. described in the book called Intergenerational Healing. Uh -huh. And uh, I'm really happy with it. It's where, if I, I'll describe it as briefly as possible, CJ, um, you uh, identify a condition for which you seek healing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and again, it could be physical, mental, emotional, whatever it may be. Yeah. And then what you do, it, it takes a while to set this up, but you basically, you line up your ancestors, um, starting with your parents in front of you, and then your grandparents, and then your great-grandparents, and with the help of spirit and your spirit guides, uh, which is really a critical point yes. in this process, um, you are able to discern or spirit will help you identify which ancestor carried that same condition the strongest, mm -hmm. whatever it may be, emotional, mental, mm -hmm. physical, Let's say it's an addiction of some sort, right. and you discover that, um, yeah, it's uh, your great grandfather. And that right. spirit, you go, whoa, my great grandfather on my mother's side, really? Okay, you through this process send a lot of light and love and healing to this yes. uh, ancestor. Uh, they send back after a period of time of absorbing that, send back the now healed condition to you. You send it on to your descendants. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I saw, it's, I, I, and it's really powerful. I think just. The process. I did that one too, where I thought, okay, worry. I told you mine when oh, yeah, I found yeah, I was yeah. worried. So I just, I was shining, you know, white light. And some of these people I don't have a relationship with, but I kind of picked right. up intuitively or heard in my the voices I hear in my head that you know get, went down to my great grandfather or my mother's, you know, my mother's side. And and so I was just healing from that point all the way back, and then yeah. imagining it forward. And it was really. Yeah. It's really quite a beautiful piece of work because, as you said, time is time is it's not in the same way that we think about time. So we could be healing that, and it's coming back to us right. and healing future generations and generations back, and then the world, right? Because when we heal all these pieces, we're healing. We're all connected. So those are kind of healed pieces that kind of go into contributing to a better world. That's at least what I think. No, that's beautiful. I, I, one line I remember from the Course in Miracles I did yeah. years ago is, uh, when I am healed, I am not healed alone. Mm. And I think that really sums it up in a very simple and elegant way. When yeah. I, am, I am not healed alone, it affects, we know now that you can't just walk in a room and, and observe what's going on. You affect the room, yes. whether consciously or not, from the people who are in the room or the, the plants that are in the room. Yeah. Whatever. We affect our environment. and who, who knows how far we go? Heart math. Institute has measured the the energy of the heart, the electromagnetic energy, and they they uh, uh, apparently they 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 found out that it goes out as far as eight feet. And when uh, uh, yeah. Greg Braden asked about this, they said, "Well, it's not. It probably goes further, but that's that's as far as we can measure with the yeah. instruments we have." Yeah, so, yeah, wow, that's cool. So, so, however we heal, I think that's the key: is yeah. that we can help our ancestors move on, and. Our future generation, CJ, we know we're at a time of massive change and mm -hmm. massive awakening. Mm -hmm. You know, however spirit wants to get us, they'll get us. Mm -hmm. You know, and we just need to pay attention and listen to what spirit has to say as to how we need to go about our lives and to make a better world, to make a better human being. Mm -hmm. And I know that you, you, I'm sure you've experienced this with all the radio interviews you've done. What seems to be happening not seems to be, it is happening based on a lot of people I've spoken with. I've asked groups I've, I've spoken to about this. How many notice that you're just old stuff is being peeled away, things that don't work, habits, emotions, yes, absolutely. belief systems, you know, and, and sometimes it's a very gentle process, but often it's like, 
<laughs> yeah. It's one, of those, it's one of those where God shakes out. I definitely felt that in 2012 and it continues. And I was just talking to a friend of mine and I said, it's weird because when I look at the past now, I think about I've done so much work yeah. that when I look at the past, they almost seem like stories. I can't even remember them anymore. They're kind of foggy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Hey, I have one more thing to ask. So tell, sure. um, I'm going to actually post if, is that, is that, um, meditation actually something that uh, yeah, people can uh, get to online? Yeah, you can get it, um, on my website, earthmagic.net. You can get it on my Facebook page, uh, DR, Dr. Stephen Farmer. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can get it through the publisher, Hierophant, H-E-I-R-O-P-H-A-N-T. Uh, okay. what did, uh, the deal Speaking of marketing, the deal, the uh -huh. deal. But it's a good. I think it's a good thing. Is you buy the yeah. book, you can download the meditation. Oh, it, okay. It's, it's a again, as as you commented yourself, it's a really powerful meditation. Yeah. I've done it several times, and one of my favorite stories that I've gotten feedback, quite a bit of feedback about it. But one of my favorite stories is a woman wrote me the next day. Uh, it's about four, three or four years ago. After a workshop, she wrote me and said. Hey, I did that exercise and uh, with my grandfather, and I had an interesting dream last night. <laughs> and uh, what I was walking through the woods, and I noticed there was a fire over not too far from me, and a looks like a bunch of men in a circle around the fire. And I walked up, and I noticed uh, when I was a few feet away that in front of me, with his back turned, was my grandfather. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather turned to me in the dream, turned to me, and said, "Thank you. Oh. I can now sit in circle." Oh my God, that's that powerful? powerful. It's beautiful. I mean, that's one of a, quite a few stories, and I, yeah. I invite people to oh, send stories. Oh, that's that. beautiful. And that's based on this process, this meditation. Wow. Oh, uh, wow. That's powerful. Yeah. Well, so we have a few minutes left. Is there one quick one that you can share with us, a little exercise that you can share with us if we yeah. wanted to call in spirit? Um, let yeah. me do just a three minute um, okay. if we have the time to yeah. do this. So, to do this, I'd like everybody just close your eyes, wherever you're seated, mm -hmm. and connect yourself, uh, as you did with us, CJ, before the show, is to connect yourself with the earth, feel the connection to the earth through the soles of your feet, through your sacral chakra, and connect yourself upward with the celestial realm. And now what we do is to call in uh, the women who are listening. I'd like you to call in the grandmothers. Not your grandmother, but the grandmothers. Mm. So I say in my head, I'm calling in my grandmothers? Yes. Or I say it out loud? Okay, I'm calling my grandmothers. You can say it out loud or in your mind, either okay. way. Calling my grandmothers. Okay. Then calling in the grandfathers. And what I'd like you to do is you breathe and relax and allow yourself to just to release any of that extra tension down through your body into the earth below to Pachamama. <sighs> yeah, that's it. Notice, women, as one grandmother steps forward and stands behind you, and men, one of the grandfathers, the elders, steps forward and stands behind you. Notice how they place their hands on your shoulders. Perhaps you can even sense their hands. Know that they're there. Perhaps even have a, a vision in your mind's eye of that elder. Good. As you breathe and relax. And allowing yourself to just receive this blessing from this old one. This old one that loves you more than you can even conceive or imagine and carries the wisdom of having traversed spirit world, of having also lived on this planet at one time in the physical form, knows the joys inherent in life as well as the suffering and has compassion beyond anything you could imagine as you breathe in that blessing. You don't need to do anything with it, just receive. 
And now notice as another grandmother, ladies, and for the guys, another grandfather stands behind that first one. As you breathe in, that power that's being generated through these old ones. And a third comes into place behind the first and second. And a fourth, as you breathe in that blessing with gratitude. And a fifth, etc. So now uh, notice the line that stands behind you. Good. And now receiving that blessing, just allow your body to be filled with it. It may be a sensation that moves through your body. It may be a sense of peace, calm, a sense of gratitude and gratefulness for the wisdom that's available to you, the healing that's available to you with these old ones, as well as the ancestors of the land, as well as your spiritual ancestors, as well as your biological ancestors. Know that you are being asked to work with these ancestors, to call them in on a daily basis. They want to help us. Take three nice, full, deep breaths as you breathe all that in. Oh, yeah. And feel your body relax as you do. Feel the lightness and the fullness at the same time. Notice your heart, the rhythm of your heart. Be aware of your breath as you go through those three breaths. Be aware of the stature and dignity of yourself as a living human being, a living man, a living woman. How amazing it is that you have this opportunity to experience life with all of its joys and challenges and the ways that you've overcome the challenges in your lifetime with the help of spirit and with the help of other humans, animals, plants. We truly are all one. Now, as you take this next breath, just gradually and gently release these ancestors. Thank them. Trust that they want to help us and when you're ready, take your time, look around the room, notice the difference in as you look around the room, bring yourself orienting here. I want to leave, uh, leave you with a thought here, and that is, um, if you go back 10 generations, it's interesting, 10 generations, that's all, 10 generations, you have over a thousand ancestors. If you go back 20 generations, you have over a million. Mm. If you go back 30 generations, you have over a trillion. Not only that, but the other statistic that I appreciate and I think proves something very definitely is that 99.99% of our genetic coding is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. 0.01% is all that creates the color of your hair, the shape of your nose, the beating of your heart, the way that you manifest your physical form. I think that's really astounding argument of, of what we know philosophically, which is we are all one. Mm -hmm. And we could say that phrase, but I think that, that really shows that we are, that we are connected. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It means so much to me that you're listening to the show. I would love your support in any way by giving me comments below or to subscribe to the show or share the show with friends. Thank you again for your support. Love and blessings.